Good morning. It's eight o'clock. First Friday morning. My name is uh, Lasse Christensen. I'll be lecturing time series analysis. And actually, as you may have read, this is the only, you could say, ordinary lecture during this course. So maybe before we get started, I would like to just say a little bit about how things are going to be running. So today will be what you will recognize as an ordinary lecture, but the rest of the course will be flipped classroom. How many of you have tried flipped classroom before? Just a few. That is also what I expected. So basically, what's going to happen is that instead of me repeating pretty much the same lecture as last time, of course, I always change a little bit here and there. Then I recorded every lecture, chopped it down into some sh shorter podcasts. Then maybe I should even just go and show you how it works. How many of you have been logged into Did You Learn before? As well, not too many. More will probably see it during the semester, but that's the new LMS or learning management system that DTU has acquired. Um, it's being rolled out now. And the time series course, everything from here is going to happen from within here. Maybe I should show you if you go to inside. What learn is living. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, when Insight is not down and you log in to Insight, going to the course, then there will be a module that says jump to learn, which should bring you here. Or it's just, if you can read it, learn.insight.dgu.dk. Works for now. So this image here in the background, I'll get back to what data is behind that, but that's another story. There is a po menu point up here called content. Can you read it as it is, or should I zoom in? Good. Under the content here, you can, have, you can see all the weeks coming down there. And a small, if you read far enough, then there's one module down there which samples solutions to all exercises. Because there's also on the book homepage, you can also find the same solutions, but they do contain some errors. So I fi that fixed quite a bit of typos and things in the ones that I'm sharing with you guys. And the last bit down there, that's me testing. So every week besides this week, so let's go to the second week. Then there are the podcasts here. Every, after every podcast, there's a small quiz. Just did I understand one of the highlights in what I was seeing? Just to make you reflect a little bit on what was happening. Am I on the right track? What you will notice is that the sum of the length of the podcast for every week is quite a bit less than two hours. Because when you're standing there in a the studio, you're speaking at a different pace, and you're not making the same breaks that I'm doing right now. I'm making some of them, but not all of them. I'm not asking questions to the camera as frequently as I do in here, but that's why I do the quizzes. But it also means that it's perfectly fair to just rewind and hear something again. But then comes, well, and I going to answer any questions anymore? And of course I am. Um, but I find that it's much more giving for all of us to take a discussion of the difficult topics rather than me presenting everything. So what will happen is that every Friday morning from now on, at 9 o'clock till 10 o'clock, we'll discuss, you can say, the topics for that particular day. And discuss means not me asking questions, but generally you asking questions. So you are saying, this part, can you explain this in a different way? This about that or whatever. And then we take a discussion about the difficult parts rather than going through everything. So that's my interpretation of Flip Classroom. It's not to make you spend <coughs> as such more time. It's just to spend your time in a different way and give you more flexibility to learn at your own pace. 
to say, well, there's something you didn't quite understand. Well, look that up in a book or vice versa to get two different wordings of the same thing. So that's basically how things are going to be structure-wise for every week. Now, then there will be a classical exercise time from 10 to noon. And when there are assignments that are open, then I'll be here before 9 o'clock to answer questions related to assignments. But I'll prefer to keep those questions there. I know that's difficult. But it's also because I want to be the one answering questions so that everyone gets the same answer. So I experienced in other courses where a TA then answers a question, says something that was not quite the same, and then you don't get the credit you, you should have. Stuff like that, I dislike that. So actually, what I do prefer is when you have questions that others might also have, what you should do would be to go under activities and discussions. Right now, there's just a general questions thing in here, but I'll make an item here for each assignment when we get along. So questions related to particular assignments, ask them there. I will check at least daily if something happened and answer there so that everyone gets the same answer. I will repeat that when we get to the first assignment, so, and that's not now. But I much rather prefer this. I generally, only in very rare cases, answer emails that please help me about this because I want to treat everyone the same. Those questions we can take here Friday morning and then I will decide whether I need to share the answer to everyone. Because of course sometimes you have a coding issue and of course you cannot share your chunk of code solving the problem with everyone. So of course there are cases where you cannot ask the questions directly there, but in most cases it actually works out fine. I would say maybe one out of 20 questions needs to be handled on the side. Pretty much everything, is my experience, can be phrased in a meaningful way here, and thereby helping everyone. Um, so that's uh, about the structure. I'll probably get back, I'll get back to a little bit more about how we do about <coughs> assignments, how they're going to work. Maybe I should just tell you now. So according to the course database, there are going to be four assignments. And one of the things that some like and some do not like as much is peer grading. I don't know how many of you have tried it before. I won't ask the question, but how I see peer grading is basically that by reading what someone else did, you also learn something because in most of the assignments, there are not two that are alike. You always do something different. You word something different, you argue differently. And one of the things that I add value to is the arguing. Because, well, if the answer is 42, everyone should get to that. But that's not plagiarism. But if you also have the same arguments all the way wording-wise, then I will file you, and you will be out for half a year. Um, but that's another story. Hopefully none of you will get there, but that's just how our things are. Um, when I catch things, I will report it. That I can say. Um, so what I want you to do when we get there is also to think of, I don't know if you think of that when you've done assignments in other courses. But when you write, whom is the receiver of the report? If you are writing something so that your fellow students can read it and understand what you actually did, it's a different writing than if I am going to pretty much try to guess what you meant. I have quite a bit of experience in guessing what students think and meant when they write something, um, but it's not always clear for someone else to read it. Now, Sometime, hopefully not too far in the future, you're done with your education, and whenever you're writing there, many of you will be writing to peers somehow, 
or even to someone with a totally different background than your own. So it's important that you start communicating so that others can understand what you're actually trying to write, what you're discussing, what you're documenting. So that's one of the places where peer grading is a challenge to some, and to others, it's, it just worked out fine. So it's a matter of communicating in a way so that others can read it, and also trying to understand what other, others meant, and see what they did different, solving the same thing. I think there's value to that. I also recognize that there are some questions that are difficult to peer grade. Um, so this time, I will do things a little bit different. The third assignment, which is the one with the most open problem, I'll get back to that. That one I will correct, you can say, in a traditional manner uh, and go through every, everywhere. Then I will figure out if I can share some parts just to show you something. Because when I do peer grading, what I also do is I share some reference values, plots, comments, so forth. Not a, quite a full solution, but pretty much what ought to be there, so you have something to compare with. So even if you did not get things right, you have something to compare with. Because that's one of the things I've heard not working out with peer grade. If you don't know what is expected, it's very difficult to assess, well, is this number good or bad, or whatever it is. So it has to be clear how things, what, what is right, what is wrong, in order to also make sure that everything is clear, because I myself, I try to write, but I always something, sometimes write something that you do not understand exactly what I meant. That happens to everyone. So I allow you to see the questions for the peer grading before you're actually allowed to start peer grading. That means that you can read through it and say that, well, there's something here that doesn't make sense. Or I did something fantastic. Why didn't you ask a question where I can get credit for that? Stuff like that. I will repeat that when we get there. So, do you know what I mean when I mean an open, say, an open problem? <laughs> so basically, a closed problem are you can say problems of the type: What do you get if you multiply six by nine? The answer is forty-two. Base thirteen. So that's a closed question. An open question is an, a question where you have multiple answers that are correct. So I generally say that when we get, when we get there, it's basically if you all answer the same model as the best model, then I will file you all for plagiarism. You're allowed to work together and talk, usually in groups, so there will be groups where you have the same model. That's fine. But I usually end up having maybe 5, 10, 15 different solutions to the same questions. Because there are some places where you have some subjective choices. So you make a priority of something over something else. And that's how it is sometimes. So that's an open question. Question, I will try to phrase it so it's very fairly well defined, the question. You will also see open questions where you actually have to start figuring out what is actually the question. But I won't go there, I'll only take one step <laughs> out in the softer world. But that's pretty much how you can say life is sometimes. There may be different solutions. You have to pick one and present that one. I I'll repeat that when we get there. So my, my plan is that the first two will be peer graded, and then the third one, which will be larger, than the others, which will also give higher weight into the grade, is going to be you can say manually corrected, and then the last one will also be peer graded. I'm debating with myself if I should try to make the, large, the last one a smaller one, or similar to the first two in, in volume, but uh, that, that I will figure out <coughs> in due time before we get there. Um, probably it's going to be somewhat smaller, but if it's going to be half the size, I don't know. So that's the plan. That was a bit of practical information, have a little bit more. 
I will also say a little bit about what do I expect that you can do after this course, just very briefly, and then say a few words about what we're going to do, and then getting into chapter two, <coughs> just to get started there. So a little bit about me. Well, I'm working at DTU, probably not a surprise to you guys. I'm from D2 Compute, sitting in the section for dynamic systems, which means I'm in the ground floor of this building. My office is pretty much just 10 meters that way, ah, 15. So that's room 010. If you need to reach me, I mean, on something different than ha getting help for other things, just drop me an email. Um, my door is open when I'm there, but I'm not, you can say, always here. I'm doing a lot of different other things. We'll have two TAs behi besides me, Hamid and Matthias. They will come at 10 o'clock. And, well, as said before, if you have a new question, start a thread. If you find that this is something, or ask it in a different, in an existing thread, if you already had something, and do that. If, it's, if it is general and not just something personal about you. So, what is it that you are supposed to be doing? I will show will you this data later on, and we will do the modeling with this data it's quite some weeks from now, but just to show you what is that we're going to be looking at. But first, just intuitively, what, what do we look at here? We have the blue line here that represents Moskrat and the red line that represents Mink. So what we have, the data that we have are counts of fur that have been sold in Canada a bit over 100 years ago, or well, 100 to 150 years ago. So when you look at this, what is it that, what do you see? Basically, what is the first thing you, you notice when you look at this? Yes? Yeah, so there's a lot of variance in, in, in the trade rate, exactly. And it's, it's not easy to see, but actually there are, it's almost like oscillations. Now, it's, when you look at the mink, they are on a different scale. So it's hard to compare the two. But what we want to do is to make a prediction. What is likely to happen in the future? But now, I guess you all took some kind of an introduction statistics course. So if you look at the value of this dashed line here, what is the probability of obtaining exactly the number on that line? Zero, exactly. Well, actually, it's not exactly zero in this case, but if we assume it's no one distributed, it is zero. But since it's a count, it is actually an integral over a small region. But effectively, and when we talk about other things than the number of skins or something, but a temperature or something, the probability of getting the predicted value is zero. Because we are in, if we are in a continuous distribution. So what we want is to add some prediction interval with some coverage. Because then we can say, I'm 95% confident that it's going to be within these intervals. Now, in this modeling, what is being done is there's a lot of things done, but we'll get back to that. First, another example. If you look at Koroplast, I don't know if you know that company. It's a, it's a Danish company within the pharmaceutical industry. So the blue line here is pretty much showing what is happening over the last month-ish. And basically what you see, well, is it an oscillation? Is it going down? Is it just flat? It's quite difficult to say anything based on this amount of data. Now, if we include a little bit more time, this is 
a year? What can you say? You can say quite a bit more. It looks differently. You have long periods where it's kind of oscillating around some values, and then sometimes it jumps. But if we look e even further back in time, then you see yet another picture, an exponential growth, effectively. So whenever you look at well, at least some kinds of series, what you will see depends a lot on how you sample. Are you looking at daily values for something? Are you looking at five-minute values? Are you looking over just one day? Or are you looking at over, you can say, multiple years? So a lot of things will look differently. And what we're going to be talking about in many cases is one concept called stationarity. So if you look at this here, well, to some extent, it looks stationary. stationary we'll get back to what it means later on. Um, very briefly, it means that the mean and the variance is constant. It does change stuff, but believe me, this looks pretty much stationary. But when we look at this, it's quite clear that the mean value changes over time. Another thing that, when you look at this, is also that the variance down here. Here we're looking at what is the index, what is the value of this. But I don't know how many of you have been looking at financial data. But when you look at day-to-day -day changes, how do we report it? Or year-to-year -year changes in a stock? or some other asset. What, how do you report that? I added 10 points, or I added 2%. Typically, it's the latter. It's the relative change, because that's where you get the, you can say, the earning. You invest a certain amount of money. It doesn't matter what the price was in the beginning. What matters is the relative change in the price. That also means that if we do a log transform of that, then it's not. So basically, when you do this at a percentage every day, say you grow by 1%, just to say something, that would be great if you could do that uh, per day. Then whenever you get two days out, it's what you have to multiply is 1 by 01 square, cubed, and so forth. So you get a multiplicative increase, but if you do the log of that, you're adding up. That is why when we do look at the log prices, we have an almost straight line. What may also be difficult to see here is that the variance around this line is more homogeneous in the log domain than it is in the original domain. It's the same reason if you add by if you, sorry, if, if you multiply by a number with some variance on, you will see that the greater the number is that you multiply on, as in the greater the initial the price is right now, the larger variance you have. We'll see that a, a lot of times, but that's what we'll, one of the things that we'll get back to. What we will not cover is stuff like this. I don't know if you can see what happens. So airline passengers, airline flights, there's a pronounced seasonality in that in the US. These are some old data. And there's been a steady increase. I haven't updated with recent data because that's not the purpose of this. The purpose is 9-11. And well, there are some things we can predict, and other things we cannot predict. This is kind of in the cannot predict, luckily. Um, what happened shortly after was that it returned to normal and continued. Um, but that's another story. So in this case, if you do the modeling of this, then you'll make a prediction up here. You have, the, you have kind of the same seasonality, 
but it will be up here instead. So that's also saying you're 95% confident that you're going to see what, whatever you're saying in the prediction interval. But that also means that there are 5% probability mass outside. And that's for stuff like this. So a little bit more of motivation for why do time series analysis. The data here is the heat consumption in the VIX. So that's a large part of the Greater Copenhagen Area District Heating Network. What is the energy consumption there uh, during the winter some 20 years ago? So when you look at the data here, what you can see is this is the hourly data. What you can see is every day you have an oscillation with a little smaller consumption during the night, and then it increases and going up and down. What we have at the bottom here is then the ambient temperature. It's a quite different signal, but there's one thing to notice. <coughs> what is the first thing to notice? Yes? Yes. So what would be the obvious thing to do? Yes? You could do the calculation or you can do the linear regression. Now, when I did the linear regression there with the blue line, if I did this in an introductory statistics course, would I be happy? Why not? I think, I mean, it looks great. We can add confidence intervals and prediction intervals, yes. But in general, if I were just looking at the cloud of points and the fitted line there, what are the assumptions that needs to be fulfilled when you're doing a linear regression model? Yes? Yes? How well is that fulfilled? I've seen much worse. So it's, th it's not a bad relationship as such. It does help. So what are the other assumptions? Yes? They don't have to, that, they don't have to be independent. But something else has to be independent. So if they're independent, then there's a, you get a horizontal line. Um, so they're not independent, but there is something about independence. Yes? Yeah? No, that's not part of it. But just think of simple linear regression. What are the assumptions for doing a simple linear regression? You said there has to be a linear relationship. Check, that's on the list. What else has to be fulfilled? Something about the variance. It's been a long summer. <coughs> so the observations have to be independent. So basically, Let's call it A times X plus B plus Epsilon T. <coughs> Let's just label it like this. And then what we assume is that the variance out here that comes from, this, from the noise part is always the same. And we also assume that the Epsilons are independent. And depending on how you plot this, it actually looks quite well. But we just hold on one moment and discuss what is the dynamical system as opposed to a non-dynamical system. I can just say that the heating network is part of a dynamical system. But what makes it a dynamical system? Yes, and what this it, that's the core of, you could say, when things become a dynamical system and not. No, that's fair enough. 
How many of you have solved the differential equation? Anyone has not solved the differential equation? <laughs> Probably not. What is it that you look at? What is it that you do that when you solve a differential equation? Like, how many can solve, if I throw this, where it will it hit? Yes, and the differential equation, what is it that you're actually doing there? You are having some states of the system, and then you're trying to describe the development of that state over time. So it's the state in the heating network, it's the temperature of houses and stuff like that. Then you have the outdoor temperature that drives the need for heat in the houses. And then you have, you can say, how much energy can you pump into the system? What you may not think of is in a district heating network, we won't get to that, it can take up to more than half a day from you pump the water out of the plant till it actually reach the consumer. Because the pipes are so long and the flow is not too high. So when you look, I don't know if you looked around here before the summertime, we're putting in pipes like this. They can transfer a lot of heat in those pipes, but it takes a long time to do that. So you're looking at the state, you're looking at the temperature of the water in that pipe. That's also a dynamical system. This sponge here, well, it has a position and it has a velocity. That's what you're describing in that dynamical system. So whenever you have something that has a state that is changing over time, then it's a dynamical system. So that's memory. When you just do, you can say, ordinary statistics, you assume that all the observations are independent. But when you have a dynamical system involved, if you take the errors from the linear regression model from before and plot them as a function of time, they look like this at the top part of there. They're not independent. You can easily see the within day variation. You couldn't see it here because the, the dots are not connected. But in, in many, if you just go out and you can say, look at the prevalence of some disease and you sampled independent populations, then it's not a dynamic system. Then you have independent observations. But if you sample the same population over time, then you can look at the disease dynamics within that population. So there are many different objects where it may as such be a, a dynamical system. What we care about is when we observe something over time. We observe the same, you could say, unit, the same system over time. What we would like things to be is like at the bottom down here. Basically what it did, you just take all the residues up there and put them in random order. <laughs> we want that. Now, we'll get back to all these things later on. What we call this down here is white noise. Do you recall from your physics background, what is white? What is the color white? When you look at the light and you, your perception is that the color of this light in here is reasonably white, what does that actually say about the, the light? Exactly. All frequencies are represented. So all colors are equally represented. That's what is white. <coughs> if you have, you can say, red light, then the shorter wave or warmer colors are all represented. Then you will see this up here is quite red because you will see an over -represent representation of a very low frequency mode in there corresponding to the 24-hour observations. But what we want is 
to have everything being independent white noise. So today we're going to talk a bit about multivariate random variables. I don't know how much you've done of that before. So just to, for me to get a short grasp of where you are, how many of you have taken a have not taken a course in introduction to statistics? You may have a challenge, but maybe you should talk later. <laughs> how many have taken, you can say, other courses, say, a multivariate statistics course? A few. How about, you can say, a more, you can say, a, which should have mentioned a particular course, Let's just say how many have taken two statistics courses. So which one is the second one? For you guys, just mention it. Did you take it here or elsewhere? Elsewhere. elsewhere. Okay, so that's probably not going to ring so much bell, many bells to me. That's okay. <laughs> so that, that's fairly good. That also how many have taken a course on probability theory? A specialized course on that. A lot of you. Good. Um, so, was that the DTU version <laughs> for most of you? Okay. Then I know pretty much where you are. Um, that makes that makes sense. So that's good. Um, so most of you have looked at you can say random variables before. What we'll do is to generalize things in multivariate setting. Also for all of you in rather generic setting. And we'll do a little bit of general linear modeling. Very briefly, recap, you can say, the ordinary least squares method to go into some weighted least squares, and then to do some times as analysis ways of using the linear regression as a tool, but when you have samples over time. So how to get around the problems of, you can say, dependence. Of course, we'll do a lot about time series models, say a little bit about linear systems theory, or some, and then, like the example with the district heating, the outdoor temperature there is an external input to the system, and that's what we're going to model as well. Sometimes we're going to model them as input, sometimes we're going to make a system that includes both. So we can also predict the temperature. So what I want you to be able to do is, whenever you get some data, you should be able to characterize it, including what is called correlation functions. I assume you all know of correlation. And covariance functions, well, you heard of covariance. We'll get back to what it means when I add function to it. Stationarity, linearity, we'll get more particular about that. Some signal processing, filtering and smoothing. That's basically when you make the predictions, then you also make a smoothing. We'll get back to how that works. Mention the external input. And then you can say a very important part is, well, when, when you make a prediction, if you don't add a measure of uncertainty, could be just a standard deviation or the variance, could be a prediction interval, depends on the case, what makes most sense. You always need to add that unless otherwise stated. There will be one place where I ask you to just come with a point value, but generally I would ask you to also add a measure of uncertainty. So, Part of this will be a recap for some of you, and part of it will be just taking you one step further from where you were, or are. You've all heard about distribution functions and density functions, I'm quite sure. The multivariate normal distribution, just define it so that we can use it. We'll talk about marginal and conditional densities, talk about expectations and moments, 
The, you have probably heard about the expected value as being the mean value of a distribution. And then you say moments of multivariate va and conditional expectation. And then a little bit about distribution derived from the normal distribution. But that's not the core here. What is more the core is the linear projection theorem at the end. And how that you can say relates to the conditional mean or conditional expectation. But let's just get into it. You have looked at random variables before. When you make it multivariate, well, you just make a vector of random variables. So that should be pretty much straightforward. Now, when you looked at a distribution function previously, you look at the probability of observing a stochastic variable x1 being less than or equal to a given number. That's what you've looked at in the univariate setting. And in a multivariate setting, well, you just do that in all your dimensions. We call it the joint distribution function because it's joining, you can say, all the dimensions one by one. So it's, in quotes, just a generalization. One thing to notice is that an uppercase letter is a stochastic variable. When you spell face, it's either a vector or a matrix. And lowercase letters are, you can say, constants, known numbers. In this case, inputs to the function here. So they are considered known. I think it's kind of standard, but I just want to repeat that that's how I try to do things. So when we look at the joint distribution function, then we can get to the joint density function by differentiating. So we just have to do the if we have an n-dimensional system, we do the n-order partial uh, <coughs> derivative here. Sorry, it's just a word missing. Um, and as such, it's straightforward. You just have to do the derivative in the point of interest. I'm doing things a little bit more just to define the defaults one of the, my goals later on in the course is to say that this is the foundation for everything, but a lot of places will have rules that can help us do the calculations, so we won't have to solve the double integrals to get back to the distribution function. We will do some other tools to get around things, but it's good to know that what happens behind the scene, we have integrals we have partial deriv derivatives, so that's how things are behind the scenes. And we will stay mostly in the continuous case, but just defining the joint density in the discrete case, that's the probability of serving particular values. And it's only in the discrete case that you can say, if you do this in a continuous quick case, the probability of observing a particular value is zero as was correctly said over here, except that it was actually counts. <laughs> so therefore, we are doing a continuous approximation to something that was discrete. Um, in general, we will do that a lot, that some things where the numbers are fairly large, it doesn't matter if it's continuous or discrete, we'll just consider it continuous. It's only when the numbers are small that it really matters if you can treat something as continuous or discrete. Typically, already around the number of 30 units, a continuous description is fairly good in most cases. So the multivariate normal distribution, I assume you've seen that the density for the normal distribution before. So I just want to write it here. So ah, 
It rises the same way as up there. So we have a variable x, and we looked at the joint probability density function of this. Then what we have, well, in the univariate case, you have the square root of 2 pi sigma, right? So how is that different to here? We have the 2 pi raised in n half. So that means if n is 1, we have the square root of 2 pi here. So that's the same. And then we take the square root of the determinant of the covariance matrix uppercase sigma. We'll get back to how that is defined later on. So this is pretty much the variance. If it was a univariate case, this will just be sigma square, the determinant of uppercase sigma. And then you take the exponential of minus a half, that's the usual part, and then you look at how far is x from the mean value of this particular variable, and then to get the dimensions right, then instead of dividing by the variance, what we're doing here is that we measure the how does things deviate by using the inverse of the covariance matrix. So in the univariate case, univar univariate case, it's the same as dividing by sigma square. And then x minus mu here at the end, and closing. So basically, it's a matter of when you have more than one dimension, you do not, it's not sufficient to just look at the variance in that di direction. In one direction, you have to look at how does it vary in different uh, dimensions. But we'll get back to that in a moment. Just want to have it there. So what did I say? The covariance matrix here has to be symmetric because if it's not symmetric, then the variance between A and B, that should be the same as between B and A. So therefore, it has to be symmetric. It has to be positive sin definite, otherwise we cannot invert it. If you do the linear algebra, there are also statistical reasoning for it. That comes down to having a correlation that is greater than one. That's usually not the case. The notation, we'll write it just like in the univariate case, just use a vector of mean values and a covariance matrix. And then we can, as in the univariate case, we can standardize. In the univariate case, you have mean zero and variance one. Here, we just say that the variance is the identity matrix, and it's a vector of zeros. Therefore, these are both case, both phase. So if you take a standard normal, you multiply it by a matrix, and you add a mean value, then if you define sigma as t, t transpose, then you can obtain uh, any, can we say, any multivariate normal distribution that you like. Just like in the univariate case, there you multiply it by the standard deviation. Here it's something similar. It's a matrix that you multiply with. Uh, and there are different solutions to this, different factorizations of the matrix. If you do linear algebra, you probably heard about different factorization methods. So this could be the Cholesky factorization. And then you add a mean value to, to get there. Now, the same applies if you take a normally distributed variable and you make a linear transformation of that, then the mean value of that transformation is the just the linear value of the mean value, and then the variance is just like in the univariate case. What do you do in the univariate case when you take a random variable and multiply it by a number? The variance, let's take the univariate, 
If you know the variance of x, and you want to say what is the variance of a times x Do you recall? Yes? A times the of x. Exactly. So the only difference here is that you pre multiply by the by A and you post multiply by A transpose. Thereby your dimensions are also still correct. Because in general here, Y does not have to be of the same dimension as x. Could be anything. And there are more, you can say, of such relations in section 2.7. I will also add a little bit more later on, also actually documenting some of these steps a little bit more. But these are the general calculation rules. Just one more thing. So here I've plotted the density for a standard normal. 0, 1, and 1, where I just took minus that. So if you look at the density of these two, they're identical, but they're not the same random variable. So you can have two random variables that have the same density, but they're not the same. So the possible outcomes are the same, but it's not the same random variable. Just one of these small mind-boggling things that if you look at the density and say this is this, then you cannot say that if you see the same density function, it's the same random variable. That's basically it. Now, a marginal density function. Do you recall anyone from probability theory what is the marginal density of a You've looked at it in a bivariate setting, I know, many of you. So in a two-dimensional setting, we'll do it in n dimensions, but the underlying concept is exactly the same. So what we have is we have the joint density function here. Now, this is a very general case where we say that we want to say we have a subvector here of the first k dimensions, or any subset of k dimensions. And then what we do is that we take all the remaining dimensions and we integrate out that part. Now, one question. When you integrate over a density function, over the entire outcome space, what do you get? One, exactly. I'm happy, I was happy to hear more saying that. <laughs> so basically, you integrate out here. And I'll just try to show some graphs. 3D visualization. I generally dislike 3D graphs as such because I find it much easier to see from an image or contour plot what is actually going on. Because you cannot, I mean, when I point here, what is the value here? Bah. But if it put here, well, if I added the color bar, it didn't do it here, then I could actually see that this orange, this shade of orange is this particular value. So in general, whenever you're going to plot something like this, it's much easier to do it <coughs> in a 2D plot whenever you can do it. That was a personal thing, uh, but I see many of you nodding. So that's good. <laughs> so a marginal density of x1 here, that means that what I'm going to do up here is, well, if this is just x1, then I have to integrate everything else out. That means I have to integrate x2 out. And it, so basically, for every value of x1 down here, what I have to do is to make an integral a vertical integral here. Does that make sense? So in order to get the value here at minus 0.6 of 0.1, I go to minus 0.6 here, and then I integrate all the values in this column. 
and then I get that value. And then I do that for every value of x1, I can integrate over all x2. That also means that if I integrate, since the integral of this over both x1 and x2 is 1, to go here to the marginal density, I've integrated out one dimension. So if I integrate this, I will get 1. So that is the marginal. That's basically saying, well, what is the probability of observing x1 without saying anything about x2? So I will try to just, I'll do a drawing where I change one thing to make it a little bit more explicit than what is on that image there. I'll just plot the contours x1, x2. So what is, from, from your experience, what is the difference between the drawing I made and the one in the plot there in the middle? Yes? They're definitely not independent. They're actually not independent there either. But they're less, <laughs> they're more dependent here. It's difficult to see in that plot. I know. But it does have a small tilt in the same direction as this. So what is it that you say, why can you say that they're not independent? What would you see if they were independent? What, what you say is exactly correct. Um, as such, actually, you're answering almo almost answering the next question. <laughs> so, if they are independent, that means what is the most likely value of x2 if I know x1? That should be that should be the same for all values. But what you see here is that you have a major axis here, kind of saying that for a given value of x1, then X, the uh, most likely value of x2 is different. Exactly. So how should I draw the contours so that they are independent? Perfect circles, exactly. Now, the next step is the conditional probability distribution function. So what can I say about the density of x1 given x2 equals to some number. Let's just write an a here. What can I say about this? So given I know x2, let's still say that this is x2. Then I get that this is the most likely value, right? Now, if I have another x2, probably ah. I get a different most likely value down here. Now, if I just take this line here, what are the numbers along this line? Well, that's the joint density of x1 comma x2, where x2 is fixed to this a, right? So I'll just write a there. Does this work out as a distribution function? Yes? 
It doesn't integrate to one because we have only integrated, you can say, in one direction. <laughs> we haven't looked at all the other values of x2. So how do we make it integrate to one? Yes? Sorry? Exactly. You can do, you can integrate, you can make the integral along the line and just divide by that. So you can take any number and divide by the same number and you get one. That's basically, so what do we call that? That's basically the integral along the red line. Yes? Normalization. It's the normalization, exactly. But what did we just look at? We looked at the marginal distribution. That is exactly what is the, what is the marginal dis distribution function of x2 at this particular value. So we are just looking at x2, the marginal distribution of x2 evaluated at this point A. Now it does integrate to 1. And we see that we get different distributions. So if we were to, to show them, they will look something like this. As densities, right? So that's the conditional expectation here. And I did it for the same plot over here. And this is where you can see that they are actually not quite independent. There is a small axis, a major axis here. So that if you look at the blue line, you have one. If you look at the green line, it's shifted a little bit to the left. What I draw over there is much more pronounced, but it's the same story. So the difference is, as you were also saying, that the more correlation there is between the two variables, the larger dependence there is when you do the conditional expectation, conditional distribution. Intuitively, it makes a lot of sense. If there's a lot of, uh, of correlation between two things, and you condition of the value of the other, it provides more information about where you are. So that's the conditional distribution. I think we should take a break now and start, say, take a 10-minute break and start 12 minutes past. <laughs>